G'day, I'm Billy Birmingham. Tonight, Crash catches up with one of Australia's most popular all-rounders. Born in Deniliquin, New South Wales in 1963, he went on to play six test matches and 87 one-dayers. He's a champion bloke, he's a cricket legend, and he is Simon O'Donnell. Welcome to Cricket Legends, Simon. I'm not 100% sure why I'm in this. <laughs> a, a cricket show or something like that, Crash, I can understand, but Cricket Legends, I, I'm a touch on the uncomfortable side, but let's see if we get through OK. Well, I'll give you one reason why you're here, right? One of the biggest sixes ever hit, 122 metres at the MCG off Greg Matthews. That's an extraordinary hit, Simon. And they've got a, a beige seat to commemorate it. Like, uh, can you tell us about that for a start? Well, plank of wood in those days, it would still be going in the modern day uh, course crash. Um, <laughs> no, it wouldn't. Uh, uh, it just happened. Mo bowled it, I hit it. Um, still to this day, and, and that's when they were building the, the new Great Southern Stand, there had to be some assistance somewhere, in my opinion. So it's, it's hit a, some whirly-whirly up there to take it a bit further, because I don't think I, you could, I could ever have done it again. But, you know, I say to my kids now that, um, you know, People get bronzed and statues and uh, I've got a seat that people put their bum on every time they go to the cricket. You know, what a lovely way to be remembered. You played in a, th the last of the all-season sportsmen, weren't you? Like, you played 24 games for St Kilda. I'm quite fascinated by the story behind your first game when you were placed on the great Hawthorne star Michael Tuck. <laughs> now, who only once in his career, I believe, was reported for striking mm. for a young fellow from Daniloquin. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Uh, well, he, deserved, he probably should have struck me a number of times. I was, I was a complete and utter smart Alec. But there was a, a, a backstory to that. The backstory to that, Alex Jeslinka was the coach of the St Kilda Footy Club, and we had a team meeting on the Thursday night, and they, they announced the team, and, and I was in it. And then you go off into the players' room, and, and um, Alex goes through the, the tactics for the weekend, so you've got time to, to soak them in and, and uh, arrive at the ground all ready to go on the Saturday. And, and he gave, you know, a couple of run-with roles. And one, I was one who had a run-with role, and that was with Michael Tuck. And I think he probably saw my body language and said, you know, I've been watching this bloke, you know, since I was a little nipper. Now I'm going to play footy on him in my first game, you know. So when the meeting had finished, Alex asked me to stay. And I'll, I'll never forget it. It was a, it was a sport-changing, if not life-changing moment for me. And he sat me down, he sat next to me, he said, um, everything OK? I said, yeah. And he said... Son, I'll never ask you to do something I don't think you're capable of. Well, I was 10 foot tall. You know, it, it, didn't, it could have been the greatest football ever to walk the earth. You know, when Alex Jeslenko said that to me, it was, it was game on. So what did you say to him and what did he do to you? Oh, I probably fainted <laughs> because he actually paid me some attention. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to repeat what I did, but it wasn't right. And he he had every right to belt me. So was it verbal or physical? <laughs> well, uh, verbal was from the start because I, I was a I was a smart aleck and thought you know I'm the I'm the greatest in the world after the meeting with Alex on on the Thursday night. Um, and then it, it what I did was um, physical, and you know, Tucky deserved to to belt me, albeit you know I think when he turned around and or came back at me, uh, I remember it quite distinctly. When he came back at me, I, I'm, I'm not, still not 100% sure he hit me or I fainted, one of the two, that, oh, hang on, he's actually paying me attention. Um, <laughs> so you are quite happy. <laughs> I was happy. I was like, oh, I've, I've done my job here. He's, he's actually finally paying me some attention. Uh, and I think it was later in the game. It might have been third quarter or late in the second, something like that, but um, that's the way things go. It was a great learning process. Now, Simon, I, I guess the great highlight of your career was being part of the 1987 World Cup win in India and Pakistan, which caught the cricket world by surprise, didn't it? Australia were incredible underdogs. Uh, you know, what was it like, that, that tournament to you? It must have been just magnificent after a rugged decade. Yeah, it was. It, you know, we had all those retirements. You know, Chapel, Lily, Mars were two years prior to that. I think they were 83 or 84, somewhere around that period. And so there was a massive turnover of players. Uh, you know, off we went in 87 and you know, no one gave us a hope. But, you, know, you know, in those days, Chris, you'd, you'd have your journos coming from all, all the, the different um, news companies. You'd have a, you know, a couple of TV 
um, stations coming with you and, you know, you'd all travel on the same bus. Well, there was only the players on the bus. There was no one even said, well, we won't be sending any teams over. There's no need to. They'll get smashed. So um, it was, was a really... We, we really bound tight in the first two weeks we were there and had a number of meetings about where we're at and where we want to be. And Bob Simpson was fantastic in that time uh, in that, you know, he really simplified the game to us and took us back to a, a very much a basic level, a park level of cricket. You know, you know we're, we're going to be the best fielding side, we're going to be the best catching side, we're going to, you know, take the most singles because statistics say that 80 or 90% of one day internationals are won by the side that takes the most singles. So it was a really... Um, uh, everyone buying into that and saying, yep, let's go about it. And, you know, guys, you know, India was, is a challenging place still, but, you know, guys would be falling over at practice. You know, Chuck Reed, poor old Chuck, who's, um, you know, he, he was, he, he couldn't put a kilo on no matter what you fed him. And, and you know, blokes that were just keeling over in this heat that was completely oppressive. And you'd just pick them up, put them under a palm tree, took, tip water on the head and say, come on, get up and go again. And that's that's the attitude we took into the whole 10 or 12 weeks and it culminated in a World Cup win. And, of course, you had your own very, very private secret, didn't you, during the tournament? You were battling cancer. Uh, in, in, did you know it was cancer, Simon, or did you just have oh, a suspicion? Chris, oh, I had a suspicion. You know, any lumps and bumps, you know, doesn't matter what age you are, you have a suspicion that... that but, um, yeah, I, uh, and I had some treatment before I left and... Um, had some pretty heavy, heavy duty antibiotics thumped into a, a lump on my ribs, and you know it grew back and had a couple of mates when it came back, um, and, and that's probably when I really thought, oh, hang on, this is there's something that needs to be dealt with here when I get home. But you know, again, you, you were committed to what we're doing, and, and I'm no martyr. You know, I, I was no martyr. I just I, probably it was completely and utterly selfish terms I'm talking of here, is that. I wanted to be part of a World Cup victory, and you know the, the health thing can wait till later on. Um, and I was I was completely selfish in that I, I wanted to be part of this, and um, you know it, it probably held me in really good stead for what then did hit me when I got home, and and how I had to react to it and work through it. But um, yeah, I, I was nothing other than 100% looking after myself in that uh, uh, there, there's something here, a job I, I've dreamt of doing. All my life as a kid, and you know the the pain and everything else can can wait until later on. We'll we'll get that fixed. You know, hopefully get that fixed later on. And the boys said you kept your guard up really well, except for one small occasion <laughs> when you were subdued after a celebration. They even gave you a bit of a touch up, didn't they? Well, they gave me a fine. Did they? Yeah, they gave me a fine. So after the semi final, um, it sort of hit me. I thought, gee, you know, we're now off to Calcutta, and after Calcutta we go home. And, and when we go home, I'm going to find out what's going on here. And I didn't pride myself on being a bit of a larrikin, but I'd like to be part of, you know, the, so particularly celebrations if you win and, and, and also getting people back up if we, if we hadn't gone that well. So we, we got to India and, you know, after a couple of nights at Calcutta training and whatever, we had a team meeting. And I got fined for my attitude after the game. You know, I was a bit you know, down in the mouth. And, um, Did and you it, tell we, them? No, I didn't. I didn't tell them at the time. So, you know, Swampy stood up and Bernie with a, the fine masters and, you know, fined me, I don't know, 10 US and something else and, you know, I had to wear a stupid hat for 24 hours and, you know, and that was fine. I thought that's, that's all part of it. But in the end, I thought, look, I just need for my own peace of mind to clarify this with someone just to say I'm OK. You know, I'm not... I, I'm, I'll be out there tomorrow and there's going to be... There's no issue, none whatsoever. And, and I did go to Bob Simpson the night either before or maybe two nights before, I said, look, Bob, I've got an issue. And I pulled my shirt up and I showed him what was going on in my rib cage. And I said, um, you know, be assured that nothing will stand in the way of what I have to do on Saturday and, and you know, everything, everything's... There's not a problem. Mentally, I'm, I'm up for it. Physically, I'm up for it. There is nothing, nothing that you need to entertain that, that I'm not 200% committed to what we're doing and 100% fit to what we're doing. And, you know, um, we played, we won, we had a great time and, and um, you, know, uh, you know, the rest is sort of history. What was the scariest moment you had when you came home? Uh, it, you know, finding out's the scariest thing and uh, that, that, that's the toughest thing of a cancer journey. And, again, I, I preface that by saying, you know, I, I'm no different to anyone else. I, there, there's no... I'm no martyr, I'm not tougher, I'm not stronger, I, I'm... I'm a, 
a person that was in a, a, a position he didn't want to be in but was facing news that um, uh, was, was uh, part of now he's you know, going to be part of his life. And so, so you had to go... You have to go through the gamut of emotions. You can't stop any of them. And, and that's in hindsight now. But you know, you've got to let go and you, you've got to say, why, man? You've got to cry and you've got to, you know, dislike this and, you know, are they right? And if, you know, you, you, there's, there's lots of things you go through. But eventually you've got to come to a, to a place where you say, OK, now, now this is real, so what are we going to do? Um, and, and then, you know, in, in come all the, the oncology reports and, and all the information and, and you then have a picture in front of you and you've got to deal with that picture. And, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm no martyr. I was dealt a card and I had to deal with it and I dealt with it the best way I could. You know, people have often, if I can probably summarise a little bit, have said, you know, why don't you write about it? Um, I've, never wa I've never been able to come to grips uh, to be able to write about it because it's so personal that I don't want someone to pick up a book and say, I'm going to be OK because Simon O'Donnell did it that way. They have to figure out what way they want to do it. And, and I, I don't want to preempt that. I don't want to say this is the way because it, it's not. People have to find their way and th those ways can be very different and, and varied from anyone else that's gone through the, the, the same challenges. Teammates can be merciless. Uh, I remember <laughs> reading the story on when your hair fell out, Merv Hughes uh, bringing a light bulb <laughs> into the Victorian dressing room and, and calling you Uncle Fester from the Adams family <laughs> and giving you the light bulb. Like, I mean, that's... It's Merv's comedy, isn't it? Oh, I yeah. feel it, but yeah. that's not bad, no, is it? It's cricket. It's fantastic. Yeah. You know, that, uh, look, still one of the funniest... You know, there was two initial funny moments. One was Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister at that time and, and you know, we'd come back from a World Cup so there was a bit of a profile around the cricket team and, and then I'd been diagnosed with cancer and, and Bob was good enough to pick up the phone and ring and because I'm in the cricket family, you know that, you know, playing practical jokes is just the way of the world. And my mum came up and said, oh, Bob Hawke's on the phone. I said, give us a spell, Mum. <laughs> you know, Bob Hawke's on the phone. She said, no, it's Bob Hawke. I said, oh, all right. I picked up the phone and thought it was some fool mate and, you know, picked it up, didn't give Bob a chance to speak. Like, who's this idiot? You da-da-da, da-da-da, a few expletives. And then the raspy voice came over and, you know, lo and behold, it was Bob Hawke. I said, oh, geez, sorry, Bob. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And he said, oh, I've never been called that sort of thing before. <laughs> I said, oh, sorry. You know, da, da, da. So that, that was one, one funny part of it. But the other funny part, um, uh, Fat Cat Richie, you know, Greg Richie, who was, you know, um, uh, always, always there with a practical joke. You know, he rang and, oh, you know, Scoob, sorry to hear, you know, sorry to hear. And then got towards the end of the conversation and said... But just as a bit of an aside, he said, what are you doing with your bats? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was... I just fell to the floor in laughter. You know, it was just fantastic. It was just what you needed to say, hey, you know, you needed some light moments each day because you were in a pretty dark place and you, you, you'd float in, you'd float out. But, you know, to have those, those sort of moments and, and those sort of mates that, that, yes, they knew it was real, but they knew that, you know, in dealing with the real, you, you, you can't be... Uh, Mr. Serious 24-7, you've got to have periods of, of laughter and fun and, and so many of the, uh, the cricket guys generated those periods, which, which was always you know, much appreciated. When you came back from the World Cup, 
uh, Cricket Australia announced a $900 a man winning bonus for the World Cup. <laughs> it seems so small. Did it feel small at the time? Oh, it did after you'd <laughs> been getting cancer treatment for six months. <laughs> Wouldn't say they didn't buy too much chemo treatment, Simon. I just, uh... They weren't rushing in with drips for the 900 bucks, let me tell you. Um... But, but, but to me, that sums up the critters of the day were underpaid. I'm no, sure it no, 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 I disagree reckon? with you completely. It was all relative. Really? Uh, yeah. we, we didn't want any more. I would have done it for nothing. Mm, mm. Um, and still, I hope to this day, people still make decisions on passion, mm. not just checkbook. Mm. You know, and it doesn't matter what sport it is, I still hope that that passion's there. And then and when you watch your grand finals and your World Cup finals, and all, you know, you see that passion's still there, mm. which is great. You know, the, the money to some is a complete distraction and I think ruins careers, mm. but to the ones that stay at the level, you can still see that passion there to pay for their country and, and get their footy team to win a grand final. And, and once that starts to dissipate, all our sports are in trouble because the key to, to sport and the key to uh, the, the right attitude in its participation and the people watching mm. is there's got to be passion on that screen when you're watching it. And, uh, of course, one of your high points was in 1991 you won a car for the International <laughs> Cricket of the Year. It was an unusual one because you didn't play a test that year, so you won it exclusively on your white ball cricket. Um, can you remember the announcement and, and was it a shock? And I was going to say, what happened to the car? I was playing golf um, with a few mates at Huntingdale and a um, couple of the staff from Cricket Australia came rushing to Huntingdale and said, We've got to take to Sydney. I said, what did take me to Sydney for? Because, you know, the dinner was on and then I think there was a touring party going in the next couple of days to the West Indies. Um, and, you know, I was part dirty probably that I wasn't in that touring party. So I'm thinking, oh, I'll have a bit of golf and not going up to Sydney. So I eventually went up to Sydney and, and won the car. And in those days, the car goes into a pool. That was the agreement. I no, had no problem with that. Uh, you know, I think there was a few winners of International Cricket of the Year internationally that kept the car themselves and didn't share it with teammates, which, you know, it was always a, a question and a debate about those sorts of things. Uh, but um, the car, you know, might have been 17 or 18 people played for Australia that year, so you got one eighteenth of the value of the car. The car might have been $40,000. It was a Land Rover Discovery. And um, I'll never forget it. You know, I got my whatever one seventeenth or eighteenth of that is, and that, that again, no, not a quote. But the tax department, they hit me with the tax on the whole lot, and I said, "Oh no, no, no it's it's gone uh, seven or eighteen different ways." And I said, "Well, not according to our records. You won the car, and it was a value of forty three thousand dollars. So we we want tax." So I think I was the only bloke who ever won international cricket of the year, and it cost me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually lost money on it. So you didn't keep Bob Hawke's number, did you? That no, would have been a nice time. I fought for... him and I lost. Yeah. Yeah, I fought him and lost. You know, I fought him. When I said fought him. I wrote a letter and said, no, 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 this is you know, the way it is. And they said, no, no, pay up. And apart from cricket, you, uh, you've always loved your horse racing and no man has ever come closer to winning a Melbourne Cup without winning it, have you? <laughs> when, uh, and you know what I'm talking about, yeah, when Bauer, Bauer was yeah. beaten by a view. Uh, what were your emotions crossing the line? Did you think you'd got there? Yeah, I did. You know, I did. Um, my dad always say, you know, the horse with momentum on the line, 99 times out of 100 it wins. And it appeared to the naked eye that we had the, we had the momentum. I thought, oh, we've won this. And... Uh, you know, lo and behold, 15 or 20 seconds later, you know, the numbers come up and it's it's viewed, um, you know, bow second and you know, so you, you, we all stop hugging and kissing and hyperventilating and then, you know, we run second and you go know, over and shake Bart's hand and, you know, well done, Bart, you know, you need another one <laughs> and all, all that, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, that, horse racing it, and that race, it, it's an amazing, it's iconic, obviously, the race. The face of it has changed so much, even in the last five years. I mean, you know, Bauer um, in 2008, uh, he like he, he wouldn't even get to run the race now, you know, but he, but he you know, was within a, a millimetre, a couple of millimetres of winning it. So, so that, that, that's that's you know, it's a massive change. Um, the internationals coming in now are full of so much quality, and uh, it's just got harder and harder to win. You were Shane Warne's first Sheffield Shield captain, and when he came in, uh, was greatness evident? Like, what, what did you think first up in your serum? <laughs> it probably was evident. 
because just how, how, how easy he was about things, Warney, we went to... Um, uh, we went to Bright a Brighton Hotel, the Marine Hotel, for dinner the night before his first Shield game with the Victorian coach, Warney and myself. I said, yeah, come on, we'll go and ease, make sure he's, everything's OK. So he pumped a couple of Benson Hedges in while we were waiting for you know, our order to be taken. And then he came, the, the lady came to take the order. He ordered two bowls of chips, <laughs> four white rolls and two green citruses. Like green citrus feeding, they, they put it in planes to, as fuel. You know, they get them <laughs> flying from you know, Melbourne to London. And I, I'm looking as he you know, goes probably then for his third bung, and I'm thinking, well, it was OK doing that in front of me, but there's the coach sitting there. He was going white, thinking, who have we got here? What's this bloke? But that was Warney, and, and that probably is his strength, not that we knew it then, that, that his single-mindedness is extraordinary. And... You know, examples of that have been many. You know, sometimes one has had these unbelievable challenges off the park, but then on the park is still the best bowler and batter for Australia. I think there was an Ashes tour where he had, you know, just yep. such daunting challenges off field, but he was... I think he won the... Well, he won the man of the series. Australia lost the Ashes. He won, but he won the man of the series, got you know record number of wickets, and I think was was uh, second in our batting averages. And that's Shane Warne. Shane, Shane Warne, I've never seen anyone be able to compartmentalise, if that's the best way of putting it, saying, OK, that's that life. That life doesn't interfere with that life and that life doesn't interfere with that life. And he, and he, and he can transcend between all of them and, and have the, the right attitude wherever he goes. You only played seven tests, but you did have one great moment at Lords when you hit a six in a really tight test to win the match. Can you still re remember the shot, the vibe? The... Um, I can remember the shot. Phil Edmonds, I think, was, was by a left armour and you know, I didn't look like getting bat on it. They were going everywhere and, and AB was at the other end and he said, you know, can you hit a boundary? And I said, oh. I said, look, there, there's probably a a corridor that's three or four inches wide that, that, <laughs> that they don't seem to be turning out of. If I can get it right, who knows? And he said, well, I'll have a dash. And I said, all right, I'll have a dash. And it might have been, I don't know, the second or third ball of the next over. I thought, oh, that looks like landed in the corridor. I probably I wouldn't have a clue whether it was going to land in the corridor of no, no spin or not. And I swung and I hit it and it hit and sailed. And then I think we needed, you know, one run to win the test match. Uh, so... Yeah, that was that. Was, then I tried it again. I think it hit a four. You know, like how stupid I tried it again. But it, it um, that that was a great memory. And and you know, Dutchy Holland was part of that Test match. And you know, poor old Dutchy's not with us anymore. But yeah. but uh, you know, we had a great night in London that night. It, you know, that was you know that eighty five two. We still probably lamented a bit. We weren't far away. But it looked bad on paper in the end. We lost the last two. But, you know, after four, and we used to play six in those days, after four it was one all. You know, the, um, you know win each and two draws. It was a tough, tight series. Uh, and in the end, you know, unfortunately we just fell short. And you, you worked for 15 years on the cricket show on Channel 9 where you get to sort of see uh, behind the scenes with guys like Bill Laurie and uh, Tony Gregg. Uh, it was sort of almost... Uh, Oh, almost mythical creatures now in the commentary scene, aren't mm. they? The late Tony, but what were they like? Tell us, tell us a little bit about they, them. They, they were. You know, Richie was. Rich, Rich, Richie was my favourite. Um, you know, you were trying to do some hosting roles at times, and and Richie would would help. I'll never forget one day at the MCG, he walked in, and I had an auto cue machine on my on my camera and you know the guy up the back was writing it and I, I it was the first time I'd worked with AutoQ I didn't even know what AutoQ was and I, I was just starting out and uh, uh, you know I did my bit and uh, uh, Simon you get a mammoth so here's Rich he came over and he said um, the AutoQ he said what do you think of it I said oh I said I've never worked with it before he said look I suggest you don't work with it again <laughs> he said uh, mate uh, uh, just use your brain. There's no need to be using anyone else's. <laughs> and that was it. That's all it said. So that was that was one. You know, that was. I thought, wow. You know, so I've never used auto. I've never used auto again, no really? matter what. Yeah. Um, in in my time, 
so he was literally saying, hey, get it in your own head. You know what you're going to talk about, you talk about it. Don't let anyone else write what you want to talk about. So that was, was good. And the other thing he, he did, he said, um, uh, that, that just helps. And, and you see quite a few... He said, always... Um, he said, have, have, if you feel a bit uncomfortable, have something with you. He said, have a pen. Just have a pen in your hand. And as you're gesticulating, you're using the pen. He said, it's amazing how comfortable you feel just having that little prop with you. And from that day onwards, I always carried a pen. So any time I did anything live, I always had a pen um, in my hand, you know, that they'd be saying, Chris, what do you reckon about that? Is that... And people would say, geez, why don't you get rid of that pen? But the pen was part of the act, if you like, because I felt comfortable having a pen in my hand. The Richie legend lives on, and uh, he truly was a legend, and so mm. are you, Simon. I think uh, you spin a great yarn. Uh, I love the imprint you've made on cricket. Congratulations, and thanks for joining us on Cricket Legends. Pleasure, Chris.